Ball lightning is an unexplained and potentially dangerous atmospheric electrical phenomenon. The term refers to reports of luminous, spherical objects that vary from pea-sized to several meters in diameter. Though usually associated with thunderstorms, the phenomenon lasts considerably longer than the split-second flash of a lightning bolt. Two reports from the 19th century claim that the ball eventually explodes, leaving behind an odor of sulfur. Until the 1960s, most scientists treated reports of ball lightning skeptically, despite numerous accounts from around the world. Laboratory experiments can produce effects that are visually similar to reports of ball lightning, but how these relate to the natural phenomenon remains unclear. Scientists have proposed many hypotheses about ball lightning over the centuries. Scientific data on natural ball lightning remains scarce, owing to its infrequency and unpredictability. The presumption of its existence depends on reported public sightings, which have produced somewhat inconsistent findings. Owing to inconsistencies and to the lack of reliable data, the true nature of ball lightning remains unknown. The first ever optical spectrum of what appears to have been a ball lightning event was published in January 2014, and included a video at high frame rate. Topic. Historical accounts It has been suggested that ball lightning could be the source of the legends that describe luminous balls, such as the mythological Ankimayan from Argentinian and Chilean Mapuche culture. In a 1960 study, 5% of the population of the Earth reported having witnessed ball lightning. Another study analyzed reports of 10,000 cases. Topic: <laughs> Great thunderstorm of Widecombe in the Moor. One early account was reported during the Great Thunderstorm at a church in Widecombe in the Moor, Devon, in England, on the 21st of October 1638. Four people died and approximately 60 were injured when, during a severe storm, an 8-foot ball of fire was described as striking and entering the church, nearly destroying it. Large stones from the church walls were hurled into the ground and through large wooden beams. The ball of fire allegedly smashed the pews and many windows, and filled the church with a foul sulfurous odor and dark, thick smoke. The ball of fire reportedly divided into two segments, one exiting through a window by smashing it open, the other disappearing somewhere inside the church. The explanation at the time, because of the fire and sulfur smell, was that the ball of fire was the devil, or the flames of hell. Later, some blamed the entire incident on two people who had been playing cards in the pew during the sermon, thereby incurring God's wrath. Topic: The Catherine and Mary. In December 1726, a number of British newspapers printed an extract of a letter from John Howell of the sloop Catherine and Mary. As we were coming through the Gulf of Florida on 29th of August, a large ball of fire fell from the element and split our mast in 10,000 pieces. If it were possible, split our main beam, also three planks of the side, under water, and three of the deck, killed one man. Another had his hand carried of sick, and had it not been for the violent rains, our sails would have been of a blast of fire. The Montague One particularly large example was reported, on the authority of Dr. Gregory, in 1749. Admiral Chambers on board the Montague, the 4th of November 1749, was taking an observation just before noon. He observed a large ball of blue fire about three miles distant from them. 
They immediately lowered their topsails, but it came up so fast upon them, that, before they could raise the main tack, they observed the ball rise almost perpendicularly, and not above forty or fifty yards from the main chains when it went off with an explosion, as great as if a hundred cannons had been discharged at the same time, leaving behind it a strong sulfurous smell. By this explosion the main top mast was shattered into pieces and the main mast went down to the keel. Five men were knocked down and one of them very bruised. Just before the explosion, the ball seemed to be the size of a large millstone. <laughs> Georg Richman A 1753 report depicts ball lightning as having been lethal when Professor Georg Richman of St. Petersburg, Russia, created a kite flying apparatus similar to Benjamin Franklin's proposal a year earlier. Richman was attending a meeting of the Academy of Sciences when he heard thunder and ran home with his engraver to capture the event for posterity. While the experiment was underway, ball lightning appeared and traveled down the string, struck Richmond's forehead and killed him. The ball had left a red spot on Richmond's forehead, his shoes were blown open, and his clothing was singed. His engraver was knocked unconscious. The door frame of the room was split and the door was torn from its hinges. Topic. HMS Warren Hastings An English journal reported that during an 1809 storm, three «balls of fire» appeared and «attacked» the British ship HMS Warren Hastings. The crew watched one ball descend, killing a man on deck and setting the main mast on fire. A crewman went out to retrieve the fallen body and was struck by a second ball, which knocked him back and left him with mild burns. A third man was killed by contact with the third ball. Crew members reported a persistent, sickening sulfur smell afterward. <inaudible> Ebenezer Cobham Brewer Ebenezer Cobham Brewer, in his 1864 U.S. edition of A Guide to the Scientific Knowledge of Things Familiar, discussed globular lightning. He describes it as slow-moving balls of fire or explosive gas that sometimes fall to the earth or run along the ground during a thunderstorm. He said that the balls sometimes split into smaller balls and may explode like a cannon. Topic. Wilfred de Fonviel In his book Thunder and Lightning, translated into English in 1875, French science writer Wilfred de Fonviel wrote that there had been about 150 reports of globular lightning. Globular lightning seems to be particularly attracted to metals, thus it will seek the railings of balconies, or else water or gas pipes etc. It has no peculiar tint of its own but will appear of any color as the case may be. At Coethan in the Duchy of Anhalt it appeared green. M. Colin, vice president of the Geological Society of Paris, saw a ball of lightning descend slowly from the sky along the bark of a poplar tree, as soon as it touched the earth it bounced up again, and disappeared without exploding. On 10 September 1845 a ball of lightning entered the kitchen of a house in the village of Salignac in the valley of Carese. This ball rolled across without doing any harm to two women and a young man who were here, but on getting into an adjoining stable it exploded and killed a pig which happened to be shut up there, and which, knowing nothing about the wonders of thunder and lightning, dared to smell it in the most rude and unbecoming manner. The motion of such balls is far from being very rapid, they have even been observed occasionally to pause in their course, but they are not the less destructive for all that. A ball of lightning which entered the church of Straussend, on exploding, projected a number of balls which exploded in their turn like shells.
Tsar Nicholas II Tsar Nicholas II, the last emperor of Russia, reported witnessing what he called a fiery ball while in the company of his grandfather, Tsar Alexander II. Once my parents were away, recounted the Tsar, and I was at the all night vigil with my grandfather in the small church in Alexandria. During the service there was a powerful thunderstorm, streaks of lightning flashed one after the other, and it seemed as if the peals of thunder would shake even the church and the whole world to its foundations. Suddenly it became quite dark, a blast of wind from the open door blew out the flame of the candles which were lit in front of the iconostasis, there was a long clap of thunder, louder than before, and I suddenly saw a fiery ball flying from the window straight towards the head of the emperor. The ball it was of lightning, whirled around the floor, then passed the chandelier and flew out through the door into the park. My heart froze, I glanced at my grandfather, his face was completely calm. He crossed himself just as calmly as he had when the fiery ball had flown near us, and I felt that it was unseemly and not courageous to be frightened as I was. I felt that one had only to look at what was happening and believe in the mercy of God, as he, my grandfather, did. After the ball had passed through the whole church, and suddenly gone out through the door, I again looked at my grandfather. A faint smile was on his face, and he nodded his head at me. My panic disappeared, and from that time I had no more fear of storms. <laughs> Alistair Crowley British occultist Alistair Crowley reported witnessing what he referred to as globular electricity during a thunderstorm on Lake Pasquany in New Hampshire in 1916. He was sheltered in a small cottage when he noticed, with what I can only describe as calm amazement, that a dazzling globe of electric fire, apparently between 6 and 12 inches 15 to 30 centimeters in diameter, was stationary about 6 inches below and to the right of my right knee. As I looked at it, it exploded with a sharp report quite impossible to confuse with the continuous turmoil of the lightning, thunder and hail, or that of the lashed water and smashed wood which was creating a pandemonium outside the cottage. I felt a very slight shock in the middle of my right hand, which was closer to the globe than any other part of my body. Topic. R. C. Jennison Jennison, of the Electronics Laboratory at the University of Kent, described his own observation of ball lightning. I was seated near the front of the passenger cabin of an all-metal airliner Eastern Airlines Flight EA-539 on a late-night flight from New York to Washington. The aircraft encountered an electrical storm during which it was enveloped in a sudden bright and loud electrical discharge 0005 March 19, 1963. Some seconds after this a glowing sphere a little more than 20 cm in diameter emerged from the pilot's cabin and passed down the aisle of the aircraft approximately 50 cm from me, maintaining the same height and course for the whole distance over which it could be observed. Other accounts Willie Lay discussed a sighting in Paris on 5 July 1852, for which sworn statements were filed with the French Academy of Science. During a thunderstorm, a tailor living next to Church of the Val de Grasse saw a ball the size of a human head come out of the fireplace. It flew around the room, re-entered the fireplace, and exploded in and destroyed the top of the chimney. On 30 April 1877, a ball of lightning entered the Golden Temple at Amritsar, India, and exited through a side door. Several people observed the ball, and the incident is inscribed on the front wall of Darshani Diodi. 
On the 22nd of November 1894, an unusually prolonged instance of natural ball lightning occurred in Golden, Colorado, which suggests it could be artificially induced from the atmosphere. The Golden Globe newspaper reported, "...a beautiful yet strange phenomenon was seen in this city on last Monday night. The wind was high and the air seemed to be full of electricity." In front of, above and around the new Hall of Engineering of the School of Mines, balls of fire played tag for half an hour, to the wonder and amazement of all who saw the display. In this building is situated the dynamos and electrical apparatus of perhaps the finest electrical plant of its size in the state. There was probably a visiting delegation from the clouds, to the captives of the dynamos on last Monday night, and they certainly had a fine visit and a roistering game of romp. On the 22nd of May 1901 in the Kazakh city of Orals in the Russian Empire now Oral, Kazakhstan, a dazzlingly brilliant ball of fire descended gradually from the sky during a thunderstorm, then entered into a house where 21 people had taken refuge, wreaked havoc with the apartment, broke through the wall into a stove in the adjoining room, smashed the stove pipe, and carried it off with such violence that it was dashed against the opposite wall, and went out through the broken window. The incident was reported in the Bulletin of the Société Astronomique de France the following year. In July 1907 the Cape Naturalist Lighthouse in Western Australia was hit by ball lightning. Lighthouse keeper Patrick Baird was in the tower at the time and was knocked unconscious. His daughter Ethel recorded the event. Ley discussed another incident in Biskoswerda, Germany. On 29 April 1925 multiple witnesses saw a silent ball land near a mailman, move along a telephone wire to a school, knock back a teacher using a telephone, and bore perfectly round coin-sized holes through a glass pane. 700 feet of wire was melted, several telephone poles were damaged, an underground cable was broken, and several workmen were thrown to the ground but unhurt. An early fictional reference to ball lightning appears in a children's book set in the 19th century by Laura Ingalls Wilder. The books are considered historical fiction, but the author always insisted they were descriptive of actual events in her life. In Wilder's description, three separate balls of lightning appeared during a winter blizzard near a cast iron stove in the family's kitchen. They are described as appearing near the stovepipe, then rolling across the floor, only to disappear as the mother Caroline Ingalls chases them with a willow branch broom. Pilots in World War II described an unusual phenomenon for which ball lightning has been suggested as an explanation. The pilots saw small balls of light moving in strange trajectories, which came to be referred to as Foo Fighters. Submariners in the Second World War gave the most frequent and consistent accounts of small ball lightning in the confined submarine atmosphere. There are repeated accounts of inadvertent production of floating explosive balls when the battery banks were switched in or out, especially if misswitched or when the highly inductive electrical motors were misconnected or disconnected. An attempt later to duplicate those balls with a surplus submarine battery resulted in several failures and an explosion. On 6 August 1944, a ball of lightning went through a closed window in Uppsala, Sweden, leaving a circular hole about 5 cm in, in diameter. The incident was witnessed by residents in the area, and was recorded by a lightning strike tracking system on the Division for Electricity and Lightning Research at Uppsala University. In 1954, Damakis Tarr, a physicist, observed a lightning strike during a heavy thunderstorm. A single bush was flattened in the wind. Some seconds later a speedy rotating ring cylinder appeared in the shape of a wreath. 
The ring was about 5 meters 16 feet away from the lightning impact point. The ring's plane was perpendicular to the ground and in full view of the observer. The outer, inner diameters were about 60 and 30 centimeters 24 and 12 in, respectively. The ring rotated quickly about 80 centimeters 31 in, above the ground. It was composed of wet leaves and dirt and rotated counter-clockwise. After seconds the ring became self-illuminated turning increasingly red, then orange, yellow and finally white. The ring cylinder at the outside was similar to a sparkler. In spite of the rain, many electrical high-voltage discharges could be seen. After some seconds, the ring suddenly disappeared and simultaneously the ball lightning appeared in the middle. Initially the ball had only one tail and it rotated in the same direction as the ring. It was homogeneous and showed no transparency. In the first moment the ball hovered motionless, but then began to move forward on the same line with a constant speed of about 1 meter per second, 3.3 feet per second. It was stable and traveled at the same height in spite of the heavy rain and strong wind. After moving about 10 meters 33 feet, it suddenly disappeared without any noise. In 2005, an incident occurred in Guernsey, where an apparent lightning strike on an aircraft led to multiple fireball sightings on the ground. On 10 July 2011, during a powerful thunderstorm, a ball of light with a 2-meter tail went through a window to the control room of local emergency services in Liberic, Czech Republic. The ball bounced from window to ceiling, then to the floor and back, where it rolled along it for 2 or 3 meters. It then dropped to the floor and disappeared. The staff present in the control room were frightened, smelled electricity and burned cables and thought something was burning. The computers froze not crashed, and all communications equipment was knocked out for the night until restored by technicians. Aside from damages caused by disrupting equipment, only one computer monitor was destroyed. On December 15, 2014, Flight B6780 Saab 2000 in the UK experienced ball lightning in the forward cabin just before lightning struck the aircraft nose. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Characteristics. Descriptions of ball lightning vary widely. It has been described as moving up and down, sideways or in unpredictable trajectories, hovering and moving with or against the wind, attracted to, unaffected by, or repelled from buildings, people, cars and other objects. Some accounts describe it as moving through solid masses of wood or metal without effect, while others describe it as destructive and melting or burning those substances. Its appearance has also been linked to power lines, altitudes of 1,000 feet 300 meters and higher, and during thunderstorms and calm weather. Ball lightning has been described as transparent, translucent, multicolored, evenly lit, radiating flames, filaments or sparks, with shapes that vary between spheres, ovals, tear drops, rods, or discs. Ball lightning is often erroneously identified as St. Elmo's fire. They are separate and distinct phenomena. The balls have been reported to disperse in many different ways, such as suddenly vanishing, gradually dissipating, absorption into an object, popping, exploding loudly, or even exploding with force, which is sometimes reported as damaging. Accounts also vary on their alleged danger to humans, from lethal to harmless. A review of the available literature published in 1972 identified the properties of a typical ball lightning, whilst cautioning against over reliance on eye witness accounts. They frequently appear almost simultaneously with cloud to ground lightning discharge. They are generally spherical or pear shaped with fuzzy edges. 
Their diameters range from 1 to 100 cm .4 to 40 in, most commonly 10 to 20 cm .9 to 7.9 in. Their brightness corresponds to roughly that of a domestic lamp, so they can be seen clearly in daylight. A wide range of colors has been observed, red, orange, and yellow being the most common. The lifetime of each event is from one second to over a minute with the brightness remaining fairly constant during that time. They tend to move, most often in a horizontal direction at a few meters per second, but may also move vertically, remain stationary or wander erratically. Many are described as having rotational motion. It is rare that observers report the sensation of heat, although in some cases the disappearance of the ball is accompanied by the liberation of heat. Some display an affinity for metal objects and may move along conductors such as wires or metal fences. Some appear within buildings passing through closed doors and windows. Some have appeared within metal aircraft and have entered and left without causing damage. The disappearance of a ball is generally rapid and may be either silent or explosive. Odors resembling ozone, burning sulfur, or nitrogen oxides are often reported. Topic direct measurements of natural ball lightning In January 2014, scientists from Northwest Normal University in Lanzhou, China, published the results of recordings made in July 2012 of the optical spectrum of what was thought to be natural ball lightning made by chance during the study of ordinary cloud ground lightning on the Tibetan Plateau. At a distance of 900 meters 3,000 feet, a total of 1.64 seconds of digital video of the ball lightning and its spectrum was made, from the formation of the ball lightning after the ordinary lightning struck the ground, up to the optical decay of the phenomenon. Additional video was recorded by a high-speed camera, which captured only the last 0.78 seconds of the event, due to its limited recording capacity. Both cameras were equipped with slitless spectrographs. The researchers detected emission lines of neutral atomic silicon, calcium, iron, nitrogen, and oxygen, in contrast with mainly ionized nitrogen emission lines in the spectrum of the parent lightning. The ball lightning traveled horizontally across the video frame at an average speed equivalent of 8.6 meters per second, 28 feet per second. It had a diameter of 5 meters 16 feet and covered a distance of about 15 meters 49 feet within those 1.64 s. Oscillations in the light intensity and in the oxygen and nitrogen emission at a frequency of 100 hertz, possibly caused by the electromagnetic field of the 50 hertz high voltage power transmission line in the vicinity, were observed. From the spectrum, the temperature of the ball lightning was assessed as being lower than the temperature of the parent lightning. <laughs> <laughs> Laboratory experiments Scientists have long attempted to produce ball lightning in laboratory experiments. While some experiments have produced effects that are visually similar to reports of natural ball lightning, it has not yet been determined whether there is any relation. Nikola Tesla reportedly could artificially produce 1.5-inch balls and conducted some demonstrations of his ability, but he was truly interested in higher voltages and powers, and remote transmission of power, so the balls he made were just a curiosity. The International Committee on Ball Lightning ICBL held regular symposia on the subject. A related group uses the generic name unconventional plasmas. The last ICBL symposium was tentatively scheduled for July 2012 in San Marcos, Texas but was cancelled due to a lack of submitted abstracts. <laughs> <laughs> Wave-guided microwaves 
Otsuki and Afarutin described producing plasma fireballs by microwave interference within an air-filled cylindrical cavity fed by a rectangular waveguide using a 2.45 GHz, 5 kW maximum power microwave oscillator. Topic: Water discharge experiments. Some scientific groups, including the Max Planck Institute, have reportedly produced a ball lightning type effect by discharging a high voltage capacitor in a tank of water. Topic: <laughs> Home microwave oven experiments. Many modern experiments involve using a microwave oven to produce small rising glowing balls, often referred to as plasma balls. Generally, the experiments are conducted by placing a lit or recently extinguished match or other small object in a microwave oven. The burnt portion of the object flares up into a large ball of fire, while plasma balls float near the oven chamber ceiling. Some experiments describe covering the match with an inverted glass jar, which contains both the flame and the balls so that they don't damage the chamber walls. A glass jar, however, eventually explodes rather than simply causing charred paint or melting metal, as happens to the inside of a microwave. Experiments by Eli Jerby and Vladimir Dektar in Israel revealed that microwave plasma balls are made up of nanoparticles with an average radius of 25 nanometers, 9.8 times 10 minus 7 in. The Israeli team demonstrated the phenomenon with copper, salts, water and carbon. <inaudible> Silicon experiments Experiments in 2007 involved shocking silicon wafers with electricity, which vaporizes the silicon and induces oxidation in the vapors. The visual effect can be described as small glowing, sparkling orbs that roll around a surface. Two Brazilian scientists, Antonio Pavão and Gerson Pava of the Federal University of Pernambuco have reportedly consistently made small long-lasting balls using this method. These experiments stemmed from the theory that ball lightning is actually oxidized silicon vapors. See vaporized silicon hypothesis below. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Proposed scientific explanations. There is at present no widely accepted explanation for ball lightning. Several hypotheses have been advanced since the phenomenon was brought into the scientific realm by the English physician and electrical researcher William Snow Harris in 1843, and French Academy scientist François Arago in 1855. Topic: <laughs> Vaporized silicon hypothesis. This hypothesis suggests that ball lightning consists of vaporized silicon burning through oxidation. Lightning striking Earth's soil could vaporize the silica contained within it, and somehow separate the oxygen from the silicon dioxide, turning it into pure silicon vapor. As it cools, the silicon could condense into a floating aerosol, bound by its charge, glowing due to the heat of silicon recombining with oxygen. An experimental investigation of this effect, published in 2007, reported producing luminous balls with lifetime in the order of seconds by evaporating pure silicon with an electric arc. Videos and spectrographs of this experiment have been made available. This hypothesis got significant supportive data in 2014, when the first ever recorded spectra of natural ball lightning were published. The theorized forms of silicon storage in soil include nanoparticles of C, CO, and SIC. Matthew Francis has dubbed this the dirt clod hypothesis. 
in which the spectrum of ball lightning shows that it shares chemistry with soil. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Electrically charged solid core model. In this model ball lightning is assumed to have a solid positively charged core. According to this underlying assumption, the core is surrounded by a thin electron layer with a charge nearly equal in magnitude to that of the core. A vacuum exists between the core and the electron layer containing an intense electromagnetic M field, which is reflected and guided by the electron layer. The microwave M field applies a ponderomotive force radiation pressure to the electrons preventing them from falling into the core. Topic: <laughs> Microwave cavity hypothesis. Pyotr Kapitsa proposed that ball lightning is a glow discharge driven by microwave radiation that is guided to the ball along lines of ionized air from lightning clouds where it is produced. The ball serves as a resonant microwave cavity, automatically adjusting its radius to the wavelength of the microwave radiation so that resonance is maintained. The Handel Maser soliton theory of ball lightning hypothesizes that the energy source generating the ball lightning is a large several cubic kilometers atmospheric maser. The ball lightning appears as a plasma cavitin at the antinodal plane of the microwave radiation from the maser. Soliton hypothesis Julio Rubinstein, David Finkelstein, and James R. Powell proposed that ball lightning is a detached St. Elmo's fire St. Elmo's fire arises when a sharp conductor, such as a ship's mast, amplifies the atmospheric electric field to breakdown. For a globe the amplification factor is 3. A free ball of ionized air can amplify the ambient field this much by its own conductivity. When this maintains the ionization, the ball is then a soliton in the flow of atmospheric electricity. Powell's kinetic theory calculation found that the ball size is set by the second Townsend coefficient the mean free path of conduction electrons near breakdown. Wandering glow discharges are found to occur within certain industrial microwave ovens and continue to glow for several seconds after power is shut off. Arcs drawn from high-power low-voltage microwave generators also are found to exhibit afterglow. Powell measured their spectra, and found that the afterglow comes mostly from metastable no-ions, which are long-lived at low temperatures. It occurred in air and in nitrous oxide, which possess such metastable ions, and not in atmospheres of argon, carbon dioxide, or helium, which do not. The soliton model of a ball lightning was further developed. It was suggested that a ball lightning is based on spherically symmetric nonlinear oscillations of charged particles in plasma, the analogue of a spatial Langmuir soliton. These oscillations were described in both classical and quantum approaches. It was found that the most intense plasma oscillations occur in the central regions of a ball lightning. It is suggested that bound states of radially oscillating charged particles with oppositely oriented spins, the analog of Cooper pairs, can appear inside a ball lightning. This phenomenon, in its turn, can lead to a superconducting phase in a ball lightning. The idea of the superconductivity in a ball lightning was considered earlier. The possibility of the existence of a ball lightning with a composite core was also discussed in this model. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Hydrodynamic vortex ring antisymmetry. Physicist Demachus Tarr suggested the following theory for ball lightning formation based on his ball lightning observation. 
lightning strikes perpendicular to the ground, and thunder follows immediately at supersonic speed in the form of shock waves that form an invisible aerodynamic turbulence ring horizontal to the ground. Around the ring, over and under pressure systems rotate the vortex around a circular axis in the cross section of the torus. At the same time, the ring expands concentrically parallel to the ground at low speed. In an open space, the vortex fades and finally disappears. If the vortex's expansion is obstructed, and symmetry is broken, the vortex breaks into cyclical form. Still invisible, and due to the central and surface tension forces, it shrinks to an intermediate state of a cylinder, and finally into a ball. The resulting transformation subsequently becomes visible once the energy is concentrated into the final spherical stage. The ball lightning has the same rotational axis as the rotating cylinder. As the vortex has a much smaller vector of energy compared to the overall energy of the reactant sonic shock wave, its vector is likely fractional to the overall reaction. The vortex, during contraction, gives the majority of its energy to form the ball lightning, achieving nominal energy loss. In some observations, the ball lightning appeared to have an extremely high energy concentration but this phenomenon hasn't been adequately verified. The present theory concerns only the low energy lightning ball form, with centripetal forces and surface tension. The visibility of the ball lightning can be associated with electroluminescence, a direct result of the triboelectric effect from materials within the area of the reaction. Static discharge from the cylindrical stage imply the existence of contact electrification within the object. The direction of the discharges indicate the cylinder's rotation, and resulting rotational axis of the ball lightning in accordance to the law of laminar flow. If the ball came from the channel, it would have rotated in the opposite direction. One theory that may account for the wide spectrum of observational evidence is the idea of combustion inside the low-velocity region of spherical vortex breakdown of a natural vortex e.g., the Hill's spherical vortex. Topic. Nanobattery hypothesis. Oleg Mesheryakov suggests that ball lightning is made of composite nano or submicrometer particles, each particle constituting a battery. A surface discharge shorts these batteries, causing a current that forms the ball. His model is described as an aerosol model that explains all the observable properties and processes of ball lightning. Topic. Black hole hypothesis Another hypothesis is that some ball lightning is the passage of microscopic primordial black holes through the Earth's atmosphere. This possibility was mentioned parenthetically by Leo Vuyk in 1992 in a patent application and a second patent application in 1996 by Leendert Vuyk. The first detailed scientific analysis was published by Mario Rabinowitz in Astrophysics and Space Science Journal in 1999. <laughs> Buoyant plasma hypothesis The declassified Project Condine report concludes that buoyant charged plasma formations similar to ball lightning are formed by novel physical, electrical, and magnetic phenomena, and that these charged plasmas are capable of being transported at enormous speeds under the influence and balance of electrical charges in the atmosphere. These plasmas appear to originate due to more than one set of weather and electrically charged conditions, the scientific rationale for which is incomplete or not fully understood. 
One suggestion is that meteors breaking up in the atmosphere and forming charged plasmas as opposed to burning completely or impacting as meteorites could explain some instances of the phenomena, in addition to other unknown atmospheric events. Transcranial magnetic stimulation Coré and Coré stated that the features of hallucinations experienced by patients having epileptic seizures in the occipital lobe are similar to the observed features of ball lightning. The study also showed that the rapidly changing magnetic field of a close lightning flash is strong enough to excite the neurons in the brain. This strengthens the possibility of lightning-induced seizure in the occipital lobe of a person close to a lightning strike, establishing the connection between epileptic hallucination mimicking ball lightning and thunderstorms. More recent research with transcranial magnetic stimulation has been shown to give the same hallucination results in the laboratory termed magnetophosphenes, and these conditions have been shown to occur in nature near lightning strikes. This hypothesis fails to explain observed physical damage caused by ball lightning or simultaneous observation by multiple witnesses. At the very least, observations would differ substantially. Theoretical calculations from University of Innsbruck researchers suggest that the magnetic fields involved in certain types of lightning strikes could potentially induce visual hallucinations resembling ball lightning. Such fields, which are found within close distances to a point in which multiple lightning strikes have occurred over a few seconds, can directly cause the neurons in the visual cortex to fire, resulting in magnetophosphenes magnetically induced visual hallucinations. Topic: <laughs> Spinning plasma toroid ring. Seward proposes that ball lightning is a spinning plasma toroid or ring. He built a lab that produces lightning level arcs, and by modifying the conditions he produced bright, small balls that mimic ball lightning and persist in atmosphere after the arc ends. Using a high-speed camera he was able to show that the bright balls were spinning plasma toroids. Chen was able to derive the physics and found that there is a class of plasma toroids that remain stable with or without an external magnetic containment, a new plasma configuration unlike anything reported elsewhere. Seward published images of the results of his experiments, along with his method. Included is a report by a farmer of observing a ball lightning event forming in a kitchen and the effects it caused as it moved around the kitchen. This is the only eyewitness account of ball lightning forming, then staying in one area, then ending that the author has heard of. <laughs> Rydberg matter concept Menikin et al. have suggested atmospheric Rydberg matter as an explanation of ball lightning phenomena. Rydberg matter is a condensed form of highly excited atoms in many aspects similar to electron hole droplets in semiconductors. However, in contrast to electron hole droplets, Rydberg matter has an extended lifetime as long as ours. This condensed excited state of matter is supported by experiments, mainly of a group led by Holmled. It is similar to a liquid or solid state of matter with extremely low gas -like density. Lumps of atmospheric Rydberg matter can result from condensation of highly excited atoms that form by atmospheric electrical phenomena, mainly due to linear lightning. Stimulated decay of Rydberg matter clouds can, however, take the form of an avalanche, and so appear as an explosion. Vacuum hypothesis Nikola Tesla theorized that the balls were formed inside a gas that was highly rarefied, on the formation. 
a single powerful streamer, breaking out from a well-insulated terminal, may easily convey a current of several hundred amperes. No wonder then, that a small mass of air is exploded with an effect similar to that of a bombshell. Let us now assume that such a powerful streamer or spark discharge, in its passage through the air, happens to come upon a vacuous sphere or space formed in the manner described. This space, containing gas highly rarefied, may be just in the act of contracting, at any rate, the intense current, passing through the rarefied gas suddenly raises the same to an extremely high temperature, all the higher as the mass of the gas is very small. But although the gas may have been brought to vivid incandescence, yet its pressure may not be very great. If, upon the sudden passage of the discharge, the pressure of the heated air exceeds that of the air around, the luminous ball or space will expand, but most generally it may not do so. For assume, for instance, that the air in the vacuous space was at one hundredth say, of its normal pressure, which might well be the case, then, since the pressure in the space would be as the absolute temperature of the gas within, it would require a temperature which seems scarcely realizable, to raise the pressure of the rarefied gas to the normal air pressure. But how is it when the second discharge and possibly many subsequent ones pass through the rarefied gas? These discharges find the gas already expanded and in a condition to take up much more energy by reason of the properties it acquires through rarefaction. Evidently, the energy consumption in any given part of the path of the streamer or spark discharge is, under otherwise the same conditions, proportionate to the resistance of that part of the path, and since, after the gas has once broken down, the resistance of other parts of the path of the discharge is much smaller than that including the vacuous space, a comparatively very great energy consumption must necessarily take place place in this portion of the current path on the duration here, then, is a mass of gas heated to high incandescence suddenly but not, as before, in a condition to give up heat rapidly. It can not cool down rapidly by expansion, as when the vacuous space was being formed, nor can it give off much heat by convection. To some extent even radiation is diminished. On the contrary, despite the high temperature, it is compelled to confinement in a limited space which is continuously shrinking instead of expanding. All these causes cooperate in maintaining, for a comparatively long period of time, the gas confined in this space at an elevated temperature, in a state of high incandescence, in the case under consideration. Thus it is that the phenomenon of the ball is produced and the same made to persist for a perceptible fraction or interval of time. On the movement as might be expected, the incandescent mass of gas in a medium violently agitated, could not possibly remain in the same place but will be, as a rule, carried, in some direction or other, by the currents of the air. Upon little reflection, however, we are led to the conclusion that the ball or incandescent mass, of whatever shape it be, will always move from the place where an explosion occurred first, to some place where such an explosion occurred later. In fact, all observers concur in the opinion that such a fireball moves slowly. On the explosion If we interpret the nature of this wonderful phenomenon in this manner, we shall find it quite natural that when such a ball encounters in its course an object, as a piece of organic matter for instance, it will raise the same to a high temperature, thus liberating suddenly a great quantity of gas by evaporating or volatilizing the substance with the result of being itself dissipated or exploded. Obviously, also, it may be expected that the conducting mass of the ball originated as described, and moving through a highly insulating medium, will be likely to be highly electrified, which accords with many of the observations made.
Topic: Other hypotheses. Several other hypotheses have been proposed to explain ball lightning. Spinning electric dipole hypothesis. A 1976 article by V. G. Ending postulated that ball lightning could be described as an electric field vector spinning in the microwave frequency region. Electrostatic Leiden jar models. Stanley Singer discussed 1971 this type of hypothesis and suggested that the electrical recombination time would be too short for the ball lightning lifetimes often reported. Smirnov proposed 1987 a fractal aerogel hypothesis. V. P. Torchigan proposed 2003 considering ball lightning as a form of self-confined intense light. M. I. Zelikin proposed 2006 an explanation with a rigorous mathematical foundation based on the hypothesis of plasma superconductivity see also. H. C. Wu proposed 2016 that ball lightning arises when a «relativistic electron bunch» forming at the tip of a lightning stroke excites «intense microwave radiation» under certain conditions. As the microwaves ionize the surrounding air, their associated pressure may then evacuate the resulting plasma to form a bubble that stably traps the radiation. A. Meeson presented a theory at the 10th International Symposium on Ball Lightning, June 21 to 27, 2010, Kaliningrad, Russia, explaining all known properties of ball lightning (BL) in terms of collective oscillations of free electrons. The simplest case corresponds to radial oscillations in a spherical plasma membrane. These oscillations are sustained by parametric amplification, resulting from regular inhalation of charged particles that are present at lower densities in the ambient air. BL vanishes thus by silent extinction when the available density of charged particles is too low, while it disappears with a loud and sometimes very violent explosion when this density is too high. Electronic oscillations are also possible as stationary waves in a plasma ball or thick plasma membrane. This yields concentric luminous bubbles. Topic. See also Atmospheric ghost lights Brown mountain lights Earthquake light Hitodama Marfa lights Naga fireball Spontaneous human combustion Sprite lightning Will o the wisp Topic Notes Topic Further reading Barry, James Dale 1980. Ball Lightning and Bead Lightning. New York, Plenum Press. ISBN 978-0-306-40272-2. Cade, Cecil Maxwell, Delphine Davis 1969. The Taming of the Thunderbolts. New York, Abillard Schumann Ltd. ISBN 978-0-200-71531-7. Coleman, Peter F. 2004. Great Balls of Fire. A Unified Theory of Ball Lightning, UFOs, Tunguska and Other Anomalous Lights. Christchurch, N.Z., Fireshine Press. ISBN 978-1-4116-1276-1. Coleman, P. F. 2006, J. Psy, E. X. P. L., Vol. 20, No. 2, 215-238. Gold, R. H. 1977. Lightning. Bristol, John Wright & Sons Ltd. ISBN 978-0-12-287802-2.
Gold, R. H. 1977. Lightning Vol. 1 Physics of Lightning. Academic Press. Seward, Clint. 2011. Ball Lightning Explanation Leading to Clean Energy. ISBN 978-1-4583-7373-1. Stenhoff, Mark. Ball Lightning, An Unsolved Problem in Atmospheric Physics. Kluwer Academic, Plenum Publishers. ISBN 978-0-306-46150-7. Human, Martin A. 1984. Lightning. Dover Publications. ISBN 978-0-486-25237-6. Vmeister, Peter E. 1972. The Lightning Book. Cambridge, MIT Press. ISBN 978-0-262-22017-0.